Today I'm speaking with spiritual teacher, psychologist, astrologer, and author, the ecstatic Dr. Michael Lennox. Hello, Michael. Hey, Jack. Welcome to to the... Good to meet you too. Welcome to the Jack Stafford Experience Show. I have. I'm still looking for a name for the show. So if you how about the idea. Jack Stafford Experience Show? <laughs> oh, well, that's, that's what you're calling it now. Okay. Well, well, we'll put that. We'll put that one in. I'll pencil that one in on the whiteboard. So thanks so much for taking the time to chat to me. I've, I've, um, I'm really, you know, to hook up with someone like yourself who has so many. You're, you're a psychologist. Yes. And also an astrologist. Yes. So. And an expert in dreams, dream interpretation, meditation, breath work, prayer. I mean, I've just been on a spiritual path my entire life. And that, that now I'm, you know, spending the second half of my life teaching and inspiring and helping others. And uh, it was actually getting that doctorate in psychology was really the just the push to change my life. It wasn't like I was getting the doctor to go become a a psychotherapist. I didn't know what I was going to do when I, you know, in my late thirties, I was like, this ain't working for me. Let's change it up. And I just dove into education and it very organically led to a position in the world where I'm now teaching how to have a more conscious experience through the things that I've studied. And now I share it with the world. Oh, you've got all the bases covered there. I mean, yeah. (laughs) And I've seen you, you're doing these daily, um, uh, daily horoscopes. And um, I just want to, before we get started, I just want to, because I'm very new to astrology, um, I, have, I have complete faith and uh, well, I, just don't un- I just don't understand the way it works. And I, the, I have a, just as an anecdote, a friend of mine who's an engineer with a very is it right-brained way of looking at it he recently got into astrology he was the last person i thought would get into astrology <laughs> he got it yeah he, he was accepted he accepted it because of carl Jung's collective consciousness so maybe you could just explain that a bit to me more, more clearly well one thing that's interesting about the story that you presented for your friend who accepted the sort of intuitive elements of astrology because of his respect for Jung and Jungian psychology by the way Jung was very into astrology. One of his daughters was an astrologer. And the Myers-Briggs type index that he created is based on astrology and the different sort of energies of of, uh, uh, alternating extroverted, introverted energies of the signs he turned into the introverted and extroversion of personality. So your friend appreciates the intuitive end from his exposure to depth psychology in Jung. But trust me, it's because he's an engineer. (laughs) Because you can't get astrology unless you can add enough of the sort of intuitive perspective, but also the structural, the rational, the geometrical. The planets are simply moving and they're always in relationship. That relationship is measurable. We measure it in terms of the geometrical angles that are held between the moving bodies. Geometry is energy. Life and consciousness is energy. That energy is constantly changing day to day, moment to moment. And the movement of the planets and the geometrical shapes they are making day to day have sensation. They're like the raw materials that we're creating our lives with. And so looking at what the planets are doing on a particular day and saying, oh, well, this day, the energy is very, you know, uh, flowing and movement oriented. So you're going to have a good day kind of thing uh, uh, is would be something you would say if the planets are having sort of happy relations. Mm -hmm. But if the planets are relating in ways that are conflictual or difficult geometry, then the horoscope for that day is, ooh, we're going to bump up against our difficult energies and astrology simply describes the shifting landscape day to day. I mean, when you explain it like that, it's very logical. But to me, in my small mind, I can understand how the moon affects us because it's very close. But these planets are a long way away. How, <laughs> how come they, right. 
They're just dots in the sky. How can this? They be? are, in one perspective, dots in the sky, but we're connected to them. We're not disconnected. We are as connected to Uranus as we are to the moon. We just can't look up at the sky and see Uranus. We can look up at the sky and see the moon, and we have this scientific knowledge that the tides on the planet and the movement of the water that are on the Earth are directly impacted by the gravity of the moon and the sun. So we can sort of say, all right, it's close enough. It's big enough energy to impact the tides. I'm 70% water. I can accept that. Mm -hmm. Where you have to sort of expand that willingness to take in the possibility is just the notion that the solar system and our connection to it doesn't stop at the moon. So yes, it's vast. Yes, it's far away from our little tiny perspective, but it's no less connected. We are no less connected just because it's big and we are small. It, it being the energy of the flow of, 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 of consciousness itself and movement of the planets, we're part of that. And that's what guess, astrology takes into account. Well, I guess, you know, you can't argue with the results because... You know, I've heard no. some of your predictions for, for this year and they've been bang on. So, Well, and also, Jack, I sit with clients day in and day out. And I've done this about a thousand times a year for the last 25 years. Mm. I mean, that's what that's how busy I am now. I wasn't always that busy. But you understand I've done this thousands of times. And once you've had an experience several hundred or dozens of hundreds of times where you say, oh, my God, what happened in May? Your whole career should have fallen apart. Oh, did you meet the love of your life in February? And people, you know, look at me with that astonished look of going, oh, my God, how did you know that? It's like, well, it's it's in there. Mm -hmm. The energy shifts and changes. A good astrologer can read and interpret the sensation and the quality of energy that's going to shift. Okay, well, here's another here's another thing then. So if it's like uh, meteorology, you, you predict a heavy wind is mm -hmm. coming. And so there's the heavy force from, from Uranus. So what, um, how does it, you, you, you rely on some clairvoyance to understand how it's going to impact on this person's life because it could blow them in that direction or this direction or... It's a great, that's a great, great question. Part of my job when I'm sitting with somebody is to not over rely on what the cycles are telling me but to to combine both here's an example the planet chiron uh is the archetype that we sort of call the wounded healer and if you look at chiron's movement around a person's chart you can make some assessments about where are they at with their personal experience of healing wounds of childhood right we mm -hmm. we we a good responsible adult is always sort of looking at, well, how am I operating in the world in a way that might be better if I recognize that some of this is by challenge from how daddy was and how mommy was and how sisters and brothers were childhood wound, right? So I might speak to somebody on a Tuesday that's going through the same geometry with Chiron as someone else on a Thursday, but the Tuesday person might be coming from real deep childhood wound and trauma. So their experience of that healing is going to be much, 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 much deeper than the person I meet on Thursday who had a good sort of childhood experience and is more going through something that's more mood than change of transformation, right? So it's not one size fits all, though the sensation might be similar. Going through a wound for the person on Tuesday is going to be deep, painful and difficult passage where the same energy for someone else won't be as difficult because they're not as deeply wounded. So this is where you combine your, your psychology background with yes. this. Okay. Very interesting. Some sessions are like, I remember a session in particular was a woman who's a client, a regular client decided to gift her father a session and he comes to my place. We sit for, you know, whatever the requisite time was. And when he left, he said something to me. Interesting. He said, wow, this is sort of like a counseling session. Mm -hmm. He's absolutely right. I was counseling him on his life and how he was choosing and moving through his life. What I know that he might not know is that everything I decided to say to him, I said to him because I was looking at planetary transits that I was interpreting. So I didn't just randomly say, oh, well, you 
you'd have a better life if you stopped judging and complaining about that. <laughs> right. I use the transits to fill my mouth with the language of guidance, care, helpfulness. And every once in a while, the intuitive thing takes over and I'll speak into things that I couldn't possibly know. But it's not because I'm clairvoyant or psychic, although I think people experience that of me. I never take that on. I'm just channeling wisdom as I know how I do in this body. And if I tap in just right, open that mind up, glance an eye to the astrology, which I know like the back of my hand, stuff comes out of my mouth that is, in fact, both intuitive and practical. Okay, wow, it's fascinating. I mean, and so you also do this for the planet as a whole and nations as a whole and, uh, and this change we're going through with, uh, yeah. the, can I say the C word? Uh, it's uh... Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I've been having, this will sound awful. Let me, let me find language that won't be offensive to anybody. <laughs> as an astrologer and a human being on the planet at this time, I have been... There's, it's been a pleasurable experience to watch the unfolding of the pandemic and the virus and the astrology that's behind it, because there are absolutely things that are happening in the planets that help not explain, because, you know, planets don't do stuff to us. They reflect what's happening, right? They're not causal. They are reflective. So when in January, when the, when the virus sort of first exploded into public awareness, that was when the planet Pluto that brings death and change and the planet Saturn that brings reckoning and karma and hard lessons came together mm-hmm. in, in, a, in an unprecedented, like we haven't seen this in 500 years kind of moment. And so wow. this was part of what you're talking about, about me as an astrologer and other astrologers predicting 2020 to be the craziest year we have ever seen on the planet. So one of the things that's present in the year's astrology as well is the planet Jupiter. Jupiter's with Pluto, the planet of death, and Saturn, the planet of hard lessons. Jupiter only brings expansion and abundance and good fortune, right? Right. But he also invented global connectedness, global travel. The idea that you can move all about the world in a moment is a Jupiter idea. So Jupiter, good, but it's Jupiter's global expansion of consciousness that helped the virus spread all over the world in like an instant, right? So it's been fascinating as an astrologer to appreciate that that in the world of archetype and describing human experience from that archetypal perspective, there is no such thing as good or bad. We decide that something is good or bad. We decide that a virus is bad, but the virus doesn't think so. The virus is just consciousness of information replicating itself. So it could have been, because you didn't predict a virus at the beginning of the year. You, no. you So you, it could have been, so it gives energy to this direction and then whatever's in that flow, maybe it was a virus, maybe it was some other catastrophe. Well, and in January, dude, it wasn't just the virus. It was the president of the United States being impeached. Australia was burning off the planet. Brexit had yet another sort of kerfuffle. There wasn't anything on the planet in January that wasn't going, oh my God, the planet of death and the planet of reckoning are coming together and changing everything. So yes, you watch the news it's always like that <laughs> yes and it accelerated to an extraordinary level as soon as january 2020 hit okay. you know I'll and you. Uh, so it's interesting like the astrology of change and reckoning that i have been watching since 2019 and sort of watching the rhythms of how astrology is going to go for the rest of the year. Yeah, what's next? I mean, this is, uh, can I go <laughs> Well, there outside? is a what's next. There is a definitive what's next, which is November. No, er, the first two weeks in November is the, is the sort of last big pillar of this wild year of change. Okay. So because of planetary movement and retrograde motion, that is a planet will move forward and then will appear to move backwards. 
All planets do this. So, so yeah, well, I, explain that to me because that's okay. it's always maybe you're saying Mercury retrograde. You know, I, I can't go out for coffee today because it's Mercury retrograde. Mercury retrograde. Yeah. So, so what does that all, mean? All bodies in space that are moving will have a retrograde experience between two bodies that are moving relative to each other, but at different speeds. So we are moving through space, Earth, and okay. so is every other planet. And yeah. so there's just a phenomenon in physics that says from one moving body relative to the next, if the speeds are different, there'll be a period of time where there's an optical illusion of the appearance of backward motion. If you've ever ridden in a car and been in the passenger seat and looked out at the spinning wheels or the hubcap of the car next to you, as it passes, sometimes there's this weird little visual thing that happens where the wheel looks like it just flipping a little bit or moving Oh, yeah, I've back. seen that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's retrograde motion. Okay, okay. That's, that is exactly what's happening between the Earth and Mercury, only in a car, it happens in a millisecond, and in Mercury's movement, it happens over 21 days, whereas the slower planets, uh, uh, that same process will play out over, say, three, four, or five months. Well, how does that affect us? Well... The easiest way for me to sort of give a, an, a, a symbolic interpretation is I would akin forward motion to consciousness. Like I'm just aware, we're moving about, like, hi, my name is Michael, you're Jack, here we are, we're sitting, we're connecting, I'm conscious of this forward moving. If a planet turns around and appears to move backwards, then the interpretation we would give that is, well, what, what is backwards? Backwards implies below the surface. Uh, backwards might imply the past as opposed to the future. Um, I, being a psychologist, am in love with the unconscious, the idea that most of this experience of our humanity is unconscious. When a planet appears to move backwards, it's as if it's dipping its little pond, you know, hands in the pond of our unconscious mind. So if Mercury rules our thoughts and our conversations and our interactions, when he's moving backwards for those three weeks, our mind is focused on stuff on the unconscious, on the inside. This is why we bump into the furniture so much during Mercury retrograde, because it's through the mind that we navigate. Our mind says, turn left, turn right, put on a sweater, it got cold, right? So if that navigating mind is for three weeks going, hey, sorry, I'm going to be focusing on the internal for three weeks, <laughs> Don't move too fast because I'm not going to be here to tell you that there's a car coming. Look both ways before you cross the street. So what do we do when this is happening? We appreciate that there's an unconscious experience going on. So we move okay. slower. We're more curious. We don't react to the conversation that we're being triggered by. We might say, OK, what, what do I have to learn from this? One of the things that happens in a retrograde that I do in my daily, you know, uh, 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 red robe astrology horoscope is I might point out dates in the current moment that harken back to, you know, a few weeks earlier when Mercury triggered some territory that he revisits in his retrograde. Talk about like empirical study moments where I get to prove the veracity of astrology is if I put out a post and I say, look back to June 5th and then uh -huh. July 1st and it'll connect to now, I'll get 20 emails saying, oh my God, I look back and this was happening and that was happening. And yes, you're absolutely right. So it's about paying more attention when a planet is retrograde for the lesson or the, the awareness that might not be consciously available but is or gets made available when the planet visits the unconscious territory through backward motion okay does this tie in with your because you also do dream therapy and getting people to uh, consciousness of the dormant state so how does this tie in with with that well to me the direct tie-in is the interpretive process right that in astrology i'm looking at geometry and archetypes, and then I'm interpreting for a client. Same thing with a dream. The dreamer has a dream. It's a story told by their unconscious. The story is told in the language of symbols. Each of those symbols has some universal meaning. I'm just interpreting the universal meaning of the symbols in the dream and then holding that up for the client as a picture. Here's the story about the story. 
your dream tells this story. Here's my story about what that dream is telling you about your unconscious. So from an interpretive perspective, they're the same act for me as the astrologer and the dream expert. Though okay, from okay. the receiving end, I don't think a, per, a person could think of or feel them to be similar experiences. Although my little moniker in my business uh, sort of like brand is your ambassador to conscious embodiment. Mm. And that for me is where they both rise up, both astrology and dream work is, is that we are mostly beings of unconscious. We don't really know what's going on, though we pretend we know everything because we think we do. <laughs> well, I'm pretty unconscious. I mean, <laughs> the rest of people. Well, you're 60 miles ahead of the average person who would not say that. I cannot tell you how many times I've tried to talk to people about their unconscious racism biases and say, well, this is a thing called unconscious bias. And someone will say, well, I don't have that. I'm not unconsciously racist. It's like, wait, I'm so sorry. <laughs> is the word unconscious in that statement? So we're mostly unconscious. And what, what depth psychology teaches us about the unconscious is that when we trip on it, that's when we become more aware of who we are. Right. So we 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 see somebody or we, we interact with somebody that we're triggered by and we get enraged or we we, we have a, a, a conflict or a breakdown. Um, we can sit around and go, well, it's all their fault and talk to yourself about how they started it. Or you could appreciate that there's something unconscious for you. The shadows being triggered as you see something across the room that bothers you or triggers you and say, OK, what does this mean about me? Why is that person triggering me so deeply? And this is what it is to process unconscious material. And astrology and dream work both encourage people to appreciate more the invisible, the unconscious, the stuff that you can't know until it comes up out of you. And then you get to look and say, oh, <laughs> Oh, that's how frightened I was, or that's how loving I am, or that's how unloving I am. Uh, yeah. So how do you train people to do this? Oh, golly. <laughs> I, I, first of all, dream work is interesting, right? In that I don't remember, I don't remember my dreams. So how can I remember? That's probably the first step. How can I remember a dream? Okay, well, we'll start with that. Yeah, let's go uh, back, way back up. Way, <laughs> way, way, way back before the dream even comes. First of all, let me actually start with this about like, say, for instance, dream work. This is actually perfect as an example to someone who doesn't consciously remember his dreams. The act of our conscious awareness mechanism, the part of our mind that knows who we are, where we are, and when we are, Mm -hmm. goes to sleep when we do. Right. Therefore, the unconscious of us gets free reign in our sleep state. And in that experience, we know a lot about what the brain is doing. We know a lot about brain chemistry in the last 20 years. It's just exploded what we're aware of in, in neurobiology and brain structure and what's happening in REM sleep. There's metabolic waste is being gotten rid of in REM sleep and short-term memory is being created in REM sleep. And there's this mystical idea that the depth psychologists and the spiritual folk believe that we get opened up to this incredible soulful place where we're connected to all that there is. And if you've got a spiritual consciousness, you might even be able to accept the word God in there that we connect to our God self during our dream state. And the psychologists understand that we're doing work on things that frighten us, that inhibit us, that enrage us, that wound us in that dream state so that we can wake up better prepared to meet life on life's terms. Okay, that's happening in the psychology of dreaming, whether you remember your dreams or not. So that process, Jack, is happening for you every time you go to sleep and wake okay. up, even though you don't remember your dreams. And so on the one hand, we want to make sure that everybody understands that so they're not feeling like they are that far away from the dream process, helping their soul grow throughout the course of a life. It is happening. Okay. And then if you listen to me interpret a dream, 
and you think, oh, that's dream work. Well, you're in trouble unless like we're living together and you can nudge me in the morning and say, hey, baby, <laughs> this is what I dreamed last night. Just because I have this gift to sort of say, this is what my capacity to channel universal wisdom has to say about your dream. And you will likely go, oh, my God, that's so interesting, because that's what's been happening to me since I was 17 years old and started doing this with my high school friends. Does it make that dream work? Dream work is between you and you. So, Jack, you're already doing dream work. Okay. Now, if you want to do it deeper with deeper. more emphasis or more intensity, you sure. do have to remember your dreams. So the first step is intention setting. If you don't set the intention, how's your unconscious going to know that you've got the desire? So you set the intention by being mindful about your sleep state and your preparation for bed. So that there's a little, anything from a, a, a letter, dear higher self, please help me remember my dreams or a little prayerful, I'm going to remember my dreams tonight. <clears throat> Intention is everything. Most important thing though, is you got to put the receiving end piece by your bed, whether it's a pad and pen or a recording device, you don't want to set yourself up for failure because the moment your waking mind comes online in the morning, mm -hmm. that part of your thinking is so loud. The quiet, soulful it. place where dreams are happening gets blocked out immediately, mm -hmm. right? So the intention and the, and the opportunity is there. Okay, okay, got it, and the got it. third piece is the most important, Jack. You got to go to the pad, even if you don't remember a dream. Ooh. You got to write, I don't remember anything from last night. And then okay, maybe sure. wait a moment and see if anything arises. That act to me is the most important piece. It's that act of going to the pad that allows your unconscious to really hear your desire to keep that window of awareness open in the morning such that you will have something to pull out from the dream state and put on that pad and pen. Is this uh, classic psychology or is this your... Yeah. Uh, well, it's I, I have never read anywhere that idea of making sure you write something down. That was definitely sort of what what I would call an original idea, but Jack, there are no original ideas. There's nothing, <laughs> There's nothing I'm teaching that hasn't been around for thousands and thousands and thousands sure, of years. Sure, sure, sure. I have I'm my vocabulary. I need, I need a song here. I gotta have a song by the end here. So. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> so, the idea that there's sort of layers of dream work certainly starts with the desire to remember the dream. And if you write something down, you've just elevated your dream work to what I would consider a most remarkable sort of first step up to a higher level, just by having a relationship with your dreams, by writing them down, you are now intimately engaged with a part of your unconscious that would otherwise be quiet, secret, and hidden. Right, right, right. The very intimate act, right? Sharing a dream with, a, with another person, I think, elevates it even more. Now you're taking something that's intimate inside of you and sharing it with another human being. That's dream work, even if it's okay. casual, even if it's just like chatting about a dream you had, that's dream work because your unconscious is receiving the notion that you're interested. I guess so, because people that talk about it, they tend to remember them more and, um, mm -hmm. you know, so maybe it's, it yeah, like you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the last piece that I think is, I think you're going to love as an artist yourself is that the highest response you can give to a dream is to give your unconscious something symbolic to understand that you've heard the message, like drawing it, like a song, like write a poem, mm -hmm. like the drawing is the easiest. I've got in my, in my office, I've got, you know, all of the art supplies so that if someone's got a juicy dream and it seems time to, to, to draw it out, I'll bring out the colored pencils because the unconscious doesn't know the difference between symbolic and, and, and real ritual and, and actual. So that as you draw the dream of the assailant with the gun, mm -hmm. you're also processing with your, in, your unconscious in its own language. The unconscious speaks in the language of symbolism. That's so interesting you say that. My last guest was Bernie Siegel, and he wrote a book called The Art of 
eight links and he's a pediatric and he got all his, his patients he was taught to do it and he got all his patients to to draw a picture it had all the colors there colors were very important and he would um, interpret how they were feeling yes. based on or what the they colors were. they were choosing another thing based on their drawing you know right right it's fascinating yeah so i'm and i'm told that in the night we project astrally as well sometimes so how, how does that work well, again, it all starts with the waking mind narrator that we over identify with as who we are. The I am, I know who I am, where I am and when I am. Because that is not inhibiting how our intuitive mind can experience our bodies, it, we are freer to be in the part of our consciousness that knows that we are not our bodies. Really, our bodies are something we inhabit. Right. Whether you think of it as density of light that becomes a physicalized form, and we are whatever we are. We animate that form. Um, you know, and in, in that regard, the energy that inhabits our bodies and our bodies themselves are in a very malleable relationship. Right. Perhaps. I don't, you know, this is sort of like territory is like, I don't know if this is true. I will respond that I've left my body energetically enough times in my experience through my practice, through meditation work, through plant medicine work, through spontaneous experiences of just being in a body that has spent decades devoting to breath work and purification and a practice that allows my body to experience energetic phenomenon. And so, yeah, so if someone says to me, I left my body during my dream state, I'm inclined to, to not only agree, but to be curious about, you know, what their experience of that was. <clears throat> and if there's a, a question of like, well, what's the value of that? At the end of the day, the value is in just understanding your oneness with energy, your oneness with the thing that is greater than your experience of your mind's idea of who, where, and when you are. <clears throat> so anything that helps us go, huh, I think this conscious experience of who I am is really the smaller part of me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So because my teacher, he could um, when he, he could leave his body when he was a kid and go walking around the neighborhood, you know, with his sister. Oh, they were wow. A, and and um, are you able to control yourself when oh, you're out of the body? Not in that regard. What I have kind of the opposite experience, my body itself Mm -hmm. It's like a special effect in a movie. <laughs> that is to say, I have the blessing and curse of being able to somatically feel the energy of how my transpersonal sense of energy and my physicalized body interact. Meaning when I go into trance and go into my breath work, I'm feeling in my physical body energy spin and move around me in a way that I believe is universal to all beings in bodies. But because I can feel the patterns and the swaying and the way my breath connects to my physicality, um, my, I think I've been able to teach people about their experience of consciousness and breath and and, and opening up their instrument. Um, but in a way, I don't ever get to leave my body because I'm so fully in it. Mm -hmm. And by being so fully in it, I'm never not in an astral sort of flexibility between my relationship, between my consciousness and my body. I think that those might be the most hooey hooey words I've ever uttered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's yeah. how I experienced it. it, it, it I feel everything that is vibrationally as vibration in my body every day. In fact, when this opened up in my experience in an explosive way, in my sort of like just as I was, you know, turning like 39, 40, I had a big Kundalini explosion. I was motion sick for 18 months. Oh, wow. Just because my body was starting to feel how fast we're spinning through space. Now, I'm sure lots of people would hear me say this and go, oh, that guy's out of his mind and full of shit. But I believe that I feel 
the spin of the earth in my body every day with every breath. Mm. But Kundal, did you deliberately try to raise Kundalini or did it happen? Well, I wasn't deliberately trying to create the experience that I had, but I certainly was devoted to anything and everything that could impact my instrument from psychotherapy to, to shame courses to breath work you know experiences to retreat there was a retreat i did it if there was a pillow to pound on with a tennis racket i did it if there was a <laughs> to learn i learned it if there was a communication technology to study i studied it i was so committed mm -hmm. to healing my trauma because i came through a lot of it my mom was out of her freaking mind and my dad was no picnic either and all three of us children were a bit traumatized by wow. how we Aced. Every healer, no? I mean, every you don't get many Absolutely. healers who... Uh... I think the kids today, since the Indigo kids have been born, I think anybody born after, like, say, 1988 has the chance and the hope of coming integrated from the moment they were born. In fact, I would call that my definition of, like, an Indigo child is a being whose four body system, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual bodies are already merged when they were born. I was born in 1963 to traumatized people and wildly sensitive, empathic, and this spinning vortex of embodied energy. And I got acted on by my traumatized parents and the sibling unit that reflected that trauma. So yeah, I just dove and dove and dove and dove into anything and everything and then somewhere in that mid 30s, I did get attracted to specifically to Kundalini Yoga. It's a fairly famous Kundalini Yoga studio here in, in LA at the time, Golden Bridge. And Gurmukh was like the, the, the great Kundalini Yoga teacher of the West. And she, you know, I studied with her every Sunday for two, three years. And uh, so the Kundalini Yoga did lead to the Kundalini explosion that I had, but it wasn't enough on its own. It was also a function of all of that work mm -hmm. that I had done, you know, since I was a kid and, you know, first sort of learned meditation at 15 and went into psychotherapy at 16. <laughs> oh, wow. Because I've, um, from my studies, I've learned that raising Kundalini is, you have to have very, very good concentration. You have to be able to, because you're taking the genie out of the bottle and you've got to put it back in again. So, if you don't, some really. people, you know, they, they can't walk afterwards. They're paralyzed for, for this life and the next, you know. I mean, it's, <laughs> well, it is, it is invasive work. All of it is invasive work. Any kind of uh, technology that invades the body, whether it's Kundalini yoga or any of the other Kriya yogas that certainly emanated up out of, you know, India. You know, the tradition of saints in India were just that you got introduced to your saint maybe you went to the himalayas and you met some guy who hadn't showered in a couple of years who's been living in a cave who seemed enlightened and what did you do you spent like a day with your guru and he taught you the kriya he taught you the yoga and then he's like bye bye and you were sent off to your like life or your cave in the himalayas or maybe you were going to be a householder saint and that technology transmuted your karma and what that technology is jack is breath Mm -hmm. All breath. It yeah. doesn't matter whether you do this yoga or that yoga, whether you're a ballet dancer or a kundalini master, breath is transforming the body mm -hmm. and the wounds and the consciousness. And it is breath work of any sort that creates that discipline that you just described. Or maybe that discipline is the right area, but capacity to be with energies that are much, 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 much bigger than the body. And yeah, if you release that Kundalini snake and your embodiment isn't ready to have an enormous, you know, serpent of energy spiraling up and down yeah. your spine for the rest of your life, you're going to be in trouble. A million volts. That's right. Yeah. Because um, I'm also, I'm, I'm trying to get everyone to interview into the Ethereum Society. I'm, it's, a, it's a secret cult that I'm a member of. And, uh, okay. You know, so, uh, and the, the master was... Um, Dr. George King in Yorkshire, and he was a master of yoga. He never went to India, but after World War, after World War II, he started doing these practices. For Ten years, he did eight hours yoga every day, pranayama, mantra, prayer. Like this was such an intense practice, and he he was able to raise Kundalini in its entirety up to the to the to the crown chakra yep. and become a master. Yep. And um, he. He, Shivananda, he, she, he projected and came over to London and taught him even more teachings. 
and he got he he got in, inducted into Tibetan um, uh, mudra. Yeah, all, it's incredible techniques. And um, he actually has. There is a you're in LA. There is an Aetherius church in uh, in uh, Hollywood. Doctor King. Oh. Yo, I'm telling you. Yeah. And he he went he 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 became um, he became because it, it goes um, because one of the te- he was a master so he achieved ascension. I mean he went beyond enlightenment, cosmic consciousness, ascension, and so he could have gone on anywhere. He could have gone anywhere, but he chose he left this place. But he could have he came, went to Los Angeles. Sweetheart, if I was you know it, uh, had achieved ascension and was given the opportunity to leave, I don't know that I'd come back. <laughs> No, well, he was um, he was the he was the master for the um, for the uh, Aquarian age. So, Beautiful. yeah. So he's he had all these missions to do and all these teachings to receive. Um, so he could um, he could go he could go into samadhi. He raised raised up the kundalini just like that, and then he could um, visualize these beams of uh, consciousness from other interplanetary beings, and he could hold them to his. Um, I think his throat chakra and then they channeled through because he was like a medium but he was a medium he was a mega medium you know because mega you medium see, well one of the things I'm identifying with about you telling me this story Jack is I can feel my own kind of level of ascension mm-hmm. in the story you're sharing with me of a true master m- m- meaning I'm aware of my capacity to entrance myself and how fast I can, which today is lightning speed compared to say 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years. And I've been at this this whole time, right? So I've clocked this. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I can close my eyes and be in a trance in one breath. Wow. Absolutely. Now, if you compare this to ascension, it's like I know it. Like that ain't nothing. But it reflects the amount of effort and work I put into it. Now, I'm also 56. I don't plan on dying tomorrow, so I'm excited about how far and how fast I'll be able to get in this instrument as I keep practicing. So while I cannot identify with channeling divine wisdom at that level, I mean, not at all. I, I'm, I'm, I'm full on bozo on the bus, you know? I, I, I'm operating <laughs> well, I, in- I, You're on the front of the, I'm in the back, so. Uh... I accept that as a possibility. I know who I am. I am at the front of the bus. I have done enough work to be self-actualized. <laughs> Uh, But I also know what I'm not and know who I'm not, right? I'm still (laughs) filled with personality and I still have an unconscious. So I am still triggerable and botherable and know that there's more to go. There's further development and awareness and evolution for me in a body, you in a body. Um, Maybe not the guy we're talking about because he completed it, but all of us are on a continuum of movement throughout our lives that if we continue to do that breath work and the purification work and the, and the, you know, going into the Samadhi state as often as we possibly can generate it, whether it takes us three breaths or 25 minutes or two days, you know, in Vipassana, we evolve as we tap into those energies that are more who we are than this tiny little three-dimensional mind that thinks it's everything. Mm, wow, gosh, you've been on such a journey. I mean, I, I did Vipassana meditation before and I did lots of meditation, but I, I realized you, you, you don't, you're not charging the battery with them. A lot of the meditation is kind of you're stilling the mind and that's very helpful but so to, get the, to get up to speed. But these mantra and these practices, they, they start generating the energy that oh, you can yeah. You can pump out with healing or prayer or and energize yourself. So, I mean, what would you say to, to somebody like me who's just beginning on this road? I mean, obviously, I want to avoid the motion sickness for a year and a half. I want to, <laughs> I want to avoid paralysis uh, where it's all possible. All, your, your journey of unfolding, it already exists. Like, it's already okay. done. And it already has its own, like mine included motion sickness and beyond. And that was always going to be part of my path. Okay. Um, I also was set up to have a much mightier obstacle to push through at midlife than I suspect you Mm -hmm. are. Um, I live in the south of Italy. I'm, you know, I'm 
I'm having a good life, so no. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, I, you know, I, I, I came into this body with, you know, a lot of uh, uh, reactivity and rage, yeah. and you know, and, and you said that up. Your higher, your higher self said to you, "Okay, Michael, this is." This one needs to be, this is, you're really energized to work this is, for this, this one. This is the one. One of the things that I noticed when I was sort of, you know, after this great opening and uh, I spent a, a little time beginning the memoir that eventually I will write and was okay, in uh, well, inspiration. Want to be in my song? <laughs> <laughs> That's very funny. Um, yeah, it was just uh, uh, um, sort of this awareness that... Um, You know, that even though the explosion sort of happened in this really outrageous way that I was carried through, like, this is how open it can be. The motion sickness was because I was that open. So it's not like I got used to it. It's that it diminished. The vibration diminished after that big Kundalini opening. And I was suddenly shown that I had more shadow work to do. And so 2005 and six, I was steeped in a profound level of, of addiction and depression that was the response to that big opening. And it uh, took yeah, a couple high, of years. Yeah, yeah, it took a couple of years to train this closed up little body to generate the same kind of openness that I was being offered in this midlife Kundalini kind of experience. That was my opening, and it's not going to be yours. Mm -hmm. Your opening already exists, and once you said yes to the path, it's like, sorry, kid, that's it. You're like, you're on. You don't, you don't get to back off the spiritual path. No, no. You know, no. So that the 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 guidance or the advice is always just going to be more, do more. Right, right, right. And it's simple stuff. It's really just a matter of breath for the embodiment and discipline for the mind. We all think we can change things outside of us and we can't. We so cannot say that again. anything that's so, happening outside of us, but we can control every thought we're thinking, every thought we're thinking. You can okay, live okay. in a mind that is not passively thinking about anything. Where I'm at in my development is I can I am so disciplined with my thoughts that I can't stay in a triggered conversation inside my head for much more than about 45 seconds. Wow. Whereas I lived in that narrative for certainly the first three and a half decades of my life. Well, you and 99.999. Well, yeah, and this and this is through discipline. This is simply saying, I'm not interested in that thought. I'm going to replace it with this thought. And doing that 17,652 times a day mm -hmm. for the last 20 years. What did you do? You put notes up? You put, uh, you no, put I just did it as a prayerful practice. I, I just mm -hmm. had enough. You know, first of all, that, that Kundalini experience, like even though it snapped back and I had a long road ahead of me, it did change everything. It changed yeah, yeah. everything about how I was embodied, everything. And one of the things that all of that work up till that time left me with was awareness of what I was thinking. I was able to see or hear the thoughts I was having Right. that allowed me more easily while brushing my teeth and talking to somebody who's not in the room <laughs> to just stop <laughs> and say, wait, I'm not going to talk to Frank. He's not in the room. I'm going to put my hand on my heart, one on my belly, take a big breath and say, all is well. This is unfolding perfectly. And then I go back to brushing my teeth. And I will have in that moment a complete release of the grip that my thinking mind has on me. Now, oh, wow. what I will tell people is you might have to do that 17,562 times a day. It works every time. But if you're in a rough spot, you'll grip your mind again. But that training and that discipline is everything because our thoughts create our reality. And right. one thing that people mistake about what I mean about that, Jack, is they're all thinking I'm talking about manifestation that i want you know big money and i'm going to manifest big money and it's not like you can't do that you you can if there's big money in your hat like you can't pull a rabbit out of the hat unless there's a rabbit already in the hat if it's not in your conscious to have that big money nothing's going to put it in there 
right? But it's it's our our manifestation uh, a capacity sometimes just shows up as every thought creates form, and feelings are a form. Okay, yeah, yeah. And solid. a thought of fear or negation or attack or judgment or defense is going to create a feeling of sadness, despair, anxiety, or ennui. So that's the manifestation that you're doing when you're sitting in complaint because <laughs> the form is the feeling. So if you discipline the thoughts that you're having and stop the complaint, judgment, rehearsing, reviewing conversations, like I have a rule. I don't speak to anybody who's not in the room. <laughs> or the past. Or the past. Well, they're not in the room. Oh, I speak to myself, though. I mean, I'm always I'm here. in the room. You can speak to yourself. Ah, okay. But I would encourage you to be careful that while you're speaking to yourself, that it's not really masking that you're speaking to somebody else. Okay, all right. Wow, I'm getting such synchronicity now from you because I my, my guest two weeks ago was Stephen Hayes, a psychologist, and he came up with this ACT technique um, to, to deal with the voice. And I've already written a song about it. Otherwise, I'd write this song, but it's... Uh, <laughs> It's a give your mind a name and listen to it speak quietly like you would to any stranger you meet, agree or disagree, respectfully. Yeah. That's beautiful. And what I hear you lyrically addressing there is spaciousness in your own mind. Know what you're thinking. Mm. And most people don't. They're just thinking it, identifying with it, and they think that's who they are. But if you step back a little and have a relationship with what, are, what am I thinking? Who's triggering those particular thoughts? And why am I still connecting with that person? And yeah. what's the about These thoughtful questions about what is happening on the inside of your mind is how you change it. If you don't have enough spaciousness in your thoughts to identify what you're thinking, you can't change the thoughts. Okay. This is where meditation is helpful. Meditation helps quiet the mind. What the value of that for my money isn't the 20 minutes in the chair. It's three hours later when, because you sat in the chair for 20 minutes, three hours later, you can be more aware of what is triggering you unconsciously so that you can be with it, have a relationship with it, and then aren't just pummeled by it. Because mm, yeah. you know, I also did the passion, uh, you know, and that's difficult, you know, 10 days in, in the silence. It sounds like what you're saying is much better than, just, you know, 20 times every hour, just hand on the... Hand on the heart. Yes. Hand on the heart, one on the belly, take a breath, all is well. Which, by the way, is easier to do if you had spent 10 days in silent meditation in Vipassana. Like, that's like going to the gym, strengthening the muscle, so that on a Tuesday, right. Right, right, <laughs> you right, can right. be in some grace. Okay, wow, this has really gone deeper than I thought here then, Michael. You, <laughs> yeah, you it sounds like... Because I get, I don't know, maybe it happens to you as well, but uh, from friends and family, I get a lot of criticism for being a searcher because I tried this and you tried that and tried this and then tried that. And they say, ah, you know, and then when you finally find the, the one that works, they say, ah, that can't work because you've already, you're changing your mind every, every couple of months. So, Well, you know, the beauty of being a seeker, Jack, is that you find a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And as long as those things that you have been seeking and trying and practicing stay in your toolkit, mm -hmm. then that's, that is the value of having explored a lot of tools and tips and practices and ways and, and skills. And you just keep seeking Jack. Yeah. I keep <laughs> Okay, to a song. So, is there some, is there some, um, some phrase that you live by, or some? Um, how can I, how can I serve you with a song? How would you, mm. what would most, what or what message do you want to get out there? What would your, what would your clients like to hear? And what? Wow, I don't know that I have felt more pressure when asked. <laughs> question ever <laughs> it'll be immortalized forever in, in, <laughs> in lyrics and music so. <laughs> you know one of the things that i think is a big part of why people are 
responding to what I'm putting out in the world. Like my, okay. my reach is actively growing right now. Like it's a big moment in my teaching mm-hmm. in terms of, of attracting more and more people, which makes sense because the world is in chaos. And when the world outside is in chaos, people like to turn within. It's a valuable way. Um, but I think that the reason one of the reasons why my particular sort of beingness in the world is being responded to right now is because of how much hope I have. <laughs> like, I, I, I like, we got this. Like, I feel like we got this. I'm not afraid of the fact that the world is transforming. And that means the old world is dying and a new one is being reborn. I got my sights on tomorrow. Like I'm interested in peace for humanity. That's seven and eight and nine generations away. Mm-hmm. And that allows me to be hopeful for the mighty work that, that we're having now. So there's a thing that happens sometimes when I'll be in a session with somebody and I'll see this, the, the, the cycle that they're in. It'll be really like difficult, lugubrious mm-hmm. geometry and they are suffering and they'll tell me the thing that's happening. And I will just cackle with glee when they say, <laughs> yes, I lost my legs in a boating accident. I'll be like, oh, my God, that's so amazing because I love humanity. I love change and transformation. I love people facing their demons and saying, I got this. And so if there's something that is in my heart that is a definitive thing to say to the people who might draw near to hear what I have to say, it would be something magnificent is happening. Hope is, there's enough hope in my heart that I can hold on to it for you until you're ready to come back and say, I can hope again. Hope. Okay. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I guess people, you know, in a storm, people go, they go to the islands. No, they come to the, yeah. what's going to happen. I'm scared. I'm terrified. And I'm saying, I don't know what's because some of the people, they, they want, they want the comfort to come with what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. I know that November is going to be the worst month of the year. <laughs> oh. <from> the astrology. <laughs> But I don't know how it's going to play out. I know that Donald Trump's personal natal chart is being hit in a way that's changing his dharma for good. And it hit in January and it's hitting in August and it's hitting in November. But I don't know if that means he's a disgraced ex-president or king of the American, you know, regime that's rising up. How would I know? But I have hope that the change and transformation that's happening lifts all human beings yeah, well, inevitably it will. I mean, we're all, the only way is up, so. The only yeah. way is up. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay, well, that's beautiful, Michael. I think I think it's just so inspiring speaking to somebody like yourself who's, you know, put in so much work. You have done this work. And yes. Thank you, Jack. Yeah. yeah. Well, this was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. No worries. Well, uh, wish me luck with the song. Uh, Can't wait. <laughs> okay, Michael, you have a wonderful day. Thanks very much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. I told him of a childhood that no one would aspire to. He said, look at the strength it's given you. Tales of misfortune on a catalogue of doom and gloom. Michael just smiles at you. You're having the nightmare. You're writing them down But all you can see is the storm But the best plays are the tragedies We get shown what we need to see The moral is morality You make your own reality But I'm afraid With your frame of mind It's only gonna get darker Darker, 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 darker Than you remember Wait until November Mercury's in retro Thank you.
strength and resilience Use it to help others in need You're having the nightmares, you're writing them down But all you can see is the storm When you moan and when you curse You write your play with every verse The truth is cold may seem perverse But burn it up, live in reverse Otherwise, I'm afraid It's only gonna get darker, 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 darker Than you remember, wait until November Mercury's in retro chaos from the get-go Give it up, you reap what you sow Neptune's in the light and sad, it's feeling violent Pluto's gonna tear you to shreds la 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 The voices inside your head Only speak to people in the room You'll get happiness, you'll get health If you're not focused on yourself Just change your state of mind And it'll get brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter Brighter if you're willing to serve Crazier the world becomes Suffering in everyone The more chances to serve Your world will get brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter Brighter if you're willing to serve Go! Oh! Boom! 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 Just like that. <laughs> Damn! Brighter if you're willing to serve There you go Damn, dude That was fun Thank you that was fun. I mean, that just the song is fun. The song is awesome and fun and f- clever and whimsical. My favorite quality. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also just this, the idea that you would put together, like, you know, I'm doing what, what I love. You're doing what you love. And who would think that they could meet? Yeah. But in fact, they can. You just did it. I love that. Thank you, dude. Thank what you. Well, I'm really glad you liked it. I tried to make it as exuberant as possible. Well, <laughs> when you, that's, that's what hit me when it started. Cause you know, I did not listen before, right? right? We agreed on that. So yeah. I did not know if this was a ballad or an up-tempo or a dance tune or what it was going to be. And the moment it started, I was like, of course it's rocking and vibrant and fabulous. Cause you know, I've got more energy than the average three people. <laughs> Yeah, it just evolved into disco. I don't know how it happened. I made it kind of a, you know, a rock thing. But then I went to the studio with the other musicians and they said, no, disco. Dude, I, it's my jam. I'm, yeah. I'm not, you know, disco was my era. <laughs> I, don't, it, I didn't know that. It just, just, it just happened. So. Just great. Thank you yeah. so much, Jack. No, well, thank you for the all the inspiration with the lyrics and the, you know, I mean, I try. I think I hope I got everything in there. I mean, we talked about a lot. You put a lot in there. <laughs> it's a long song, you know. But, uh, a long song. Yeah. I also did love how you have specific things that we actually broke down and talked about in consciousness yeah. in lyric form. It's just. And I've been practicing, you know, trying not to speak to people in the room, but. I have to say that doing this podcast is not helping, you know, because I, I'm, pr- I'm, I'm speaking, I'm practicing, I research the people in advance and then I practice speaking to them, you know, so. Well, I'm but rehearsing. that's different, sweetheart. That's a conscious experience of being prepared for something you're going to do. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when you're grabbed out of your own serenity because you can't stop thinking about that person who did you wrong. <laughs> okay oh that makes me feel a lot better yeah oh thanks so much for that you're welcome sir. and I, I got it out just in time for november i, I mean yeah. i think it's not really giving people much warning but uh... i don't know that they need much warning for november <laughs> jack certainly not over here in the united states man it is heating heating up okay yeah <laughs> i guess that's astrology made easy when you're dealing with uh covid and presidential elections exactly presidential elections yeah yeah Oh, wow. What a joy, Jack. Thank you so, 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 so much. No worries. I hope now I pretty- need my copy. You can email me a copy, <laughs> right? That I can have for my of course. Very own. Spread it, yeah. spread it far and wide. I will spread it far and wide. I will share this with my audience. Absolutely. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, buddy. Bye bye. All right. Yay. Have a great day. Thank you. 
Thank you to Maurizio Sarnicola and Massimino Vodza for working with me on the music and Dori Verbo, my researcher. And thank you to you for listening. Please rate and review the podcast if you enjoyed it. If you like the song and want to support us, then you can download it for a dollar on our website at podsongs.com. It's also available on all the major music streaming services. Thanks again.